Hey everybody, welcome back to another Mac Studio video, and this time the most numbers intensive video I have ever made. Of course, we're comparing the Mac Studio to four other computers, one for one test and another for three other tests. I'll explain in a minute. This video kind of came about because anytime I go to a Mac Studio video talking about the M1 Max and the M1 Ultra, it's always talking about Geekbench and Cinebench and GFX, but all these benchmarks that are synthetic testing one piece of the hardware over another and yada, yada, yada. But I do video editing and occasionally will edit photos and I wanna dabble in 3D. And I know a lot of people I've talked to really wanna know how these machines handle those tasks. So what I've done for today's video is scoured the web for the best ways to test certain programs that I know a lot of people are probably curious about and how they handle on this machine. And today we're gonna to be testing five different programs, Final Cut, Blender, Adobe After Effects, Adobe Premiere, and Photoshop. And for three of them, I was actually able to find a benchmark test that is real world accurate. I was actually very happy to find this. It's called Puget Bench. I'll talk more about it in a minute. But as for the other two, one of them is a test of my own design, and another one is just a really complex 3D model setup. So we'll dive into each one and go over the numbers. But first, I wanna talk about the competitors that we have lined up for today. So obviously, first things first, we have the Mac Studio with the M1 Max chip sporting the 24 core GPU and 32 gigabytes of RAM with 512 gigs of storage. Literally the base model Mac Studio. Didn't upgrade a thing, clicked it, hit select, hit buy now, that was it. So that is what we have, the weaker GPU, the base model chip, and 32 gigabytes of RAM. That is our baseline. After that, we have two Mac Minis, one of which has the M1 with eight gigabytes of RAM and the other has 16 gigabytes of RAM. We threw both of those in there just to see how they would do, sort of a punching down scenario, but maybe they'll hold their own, who knows. After that, we have the last Mac in the lineup, which is the MacBook Pro that I used to own. This is an i9 MacBook Pro that I only use for the final cut test. This has the Core i9 processor in it with 32 gigabytes of RAM, a terabyte of storage, and a Radeon Pro 560X. I got rid of it, but I did run the test because I've had this test for a while, so just keep that in mind. And the last computer in the lineup is a PC, my personal gaming PC. This sports a Core i7-8700K with 48 gigabytes of RAM. It's an odd configuration, but it's what I could afford at the time. A two terabyte SSD and the GTX 1070, back before graphics cards cost an arm and a leg to buy. Also keep in mind that because the i7 is liquid cooled, I actually have it overclocked to 4.8 gigahertz on all cores. So that might have something to do with a few numbers that I saw in here, but either way, I figured I'd just disclose that now. Now as for the tests, like I said, we're gonna be testing Final Cut, Blender, After Effects, Premiere, and Photoshop. But first things first, we're gonna dive into Final Cut because I actually already did this test once, so we're gonna go over it pretty quickly. I did it in this video here. But this is my 8K Final Cut render test. What I do is I take a one minute 8K Red Raw video project, which has a couple transitions in it and varying compressions of video, and I render it out to see how quickly the computer can crank it out. Now I use Final Cut for this test because Final Cut is my editor of choice. So when I get a new Mac, I run this test to see how it'll handle my most extreme workflow. And for some of you, that might be a very realistic scenario. And for others, I'm testing something that requires so much performance that if you need anything less, you have a ton of headroom. So let's dive into the numbers. So getting into the numbers on this one, we have the last place spot going to the MacBook Pro, which cranked out this one minute clip in eight minutes and 26 seconds. That's a pretty long time to wait to watch a one minute clip. Afterwards, we did get quite a bit of a time jump going from eight minutes and 26 seconds to five minutes and 27 seconds on the eight gigabyte version of the M1 Mac Mini. And then after that is a less significant time jump going to four minutes and 51 seconds on the 16 gigabyte M1 Mac Mini. And then lastly, we have the Mac Studio. And this cranked the entire project out in two minutes and nine seconds. That's pretty impressive considering that for a project as demanding as 8K Red Raw footage, you can have it cranked out, at least in terms of a one minute clip, in a minute over real time. Now obviously this will be more time as the projects get bigger, but that means that you can potentially cut down a one day render into maybe half the day. Pretty impressive considering what I was coming from. The most extreme test I ever run and I would have been waiting four minutes and 51 seconds if I had held on to my M1 Mac Mini. It's pretty wild. And that's the only test I'm gonna be using the MacBook Pro for because obviously with Final Cut being Mac exclusive, I had to have a Mac in the mix. Now we're gonna move on 
to the blender test because this is another test that I don't have to really explain much about. It's pretty easy, it's time-based. So let's move on to Blender. Now, full disclosure, I am not a 3D modeling expert. I've dabbled in it very little. So what I did was I got the Blender Man rendering test. This is a very complex model with lighting, different shaders, different texture types, all these different things, reflectivity, a whole lot of stuff. And it's very, very processor and GPU intensive to render out. This is also the first test that I threw my gaming PC into the mix. So how did all the computers do? Well, kind of unsurprisingly coming in at last place, we have the M1 Mac mini with eight gigabytes of RAM at 29 minutes and 57 seconds to render the single frame. That's, that's a while. That's, I literally walked away and made lunch and came back. It was, it was pretty slow. Now moving on to the next one, we have the 16 gigabyte of RAM M1 Mac mini, which I thought 16 gigabytes of RAM might've helped it a little bit more just because it's shared between the GPU and CPU, but I guess not because it rendered it out in 28 minutes and 32 seconds, not a considerable difference between the two. Now the next one might surprise you because it's the Mac Studio. Yeah, the Mac Studio is actually slower than the gaming PC. It cranked out this test in 19 minutes and 47 seconds. That is, Respectable, it's definitely faster than what we were getting out of the Mac Mini, but it was still slower than the gaming PC. You know, by 27 seconds. <laughs> yeah, the gaming PC cranked it out in 19 minutes and 20 seconds, so it wasn't a massive leap. And something you have to keep in mind is while the Mac Studio was 27 seconds longer in terms of rendering than my gaming PC, I was considering putting a chalk in front of my gaming PC to keep it from rolling forward because the fans were just going at full blast, whereas the Mac Studio didn't crack 70 degrees Celsius and was dead silent. That is pretty impressive. So if you're looking for something that can be just kind of sitting there rendering away without raising your electric bill, heating the apartment and making a ton of noise, the Mac Studio might be worth that extra 20 seconds. But if you really just need all the performance, everything crammed into one and just pushed out as fast as possible. Yeah, okay, go with the gaming PC, save yourself the 20 seconds. Now, next up, I can already tell that this is going to be a test that requires a little bit of explanation. What I used for these next three tests was a tool called Puget Bench. Now, what this is, is essentially a plugin or, or an add-on to your Photoshop or Premiere or After Effects that will take those tools and run several tests with elements that are built into the program. So with After Effects, for example, it will build very complex motion blurred scenes and then render them or do several loops of testing motion tracking so that you can see how quickly a, a scene can be 3D tracked. That is what this does. It does this for Photoshop, Premiere, After Effects, and I ran this and then what it will do is spit out a digestible score, but obviously, you need context to know if these scores are good or if these scores are bad. So what we're gonna do in this case is I'm gonna throw up all the numbers and just go over each of them as I, as I talk about them. So we'll dive in first with Photoshop. So starting out with Photoshop, Puget Bench runs through quite a variety of things on screen and obviously I wasn't gonna capture it because I wanted to see what the scores would be without screen cap running, but here are all the scores. So first things first, the Mac minis were interestingly very close to one another in terms of score, despite the fact that they are eight gigabytes of RAM apart from one another, one with 16 and one with eight. They were only 17 points apart. Pretty interesting to see. But then of course we have the massive leap, which is the gaming PC. This one pulls in a score of 783, which is really impressive compared to the Mac minis. And obviously those extra cores and that graphics card are doing a lot of favors. Plus having more memory is probably doing it some favors, but not enough to beat the Mac Studio, which came in at 864 points. Now, considering that this test seemed to do a few things that Photoshop would rely on the neural engine for, I feel like that may be where some of the advantage came from for the Mac Studio, but also where the Mac Minis gained some ground with their neural engine. It's a possibility, but as of right now, it's kind of just a theory. Either way, if you're doing Photoshop work, even the base Mac Studio is a pretty hard deal to pass up. So moving on to the Adobe Premiere test, this test was a godsend for me because I'll be the first to admit, I am not that well versed in Adobe Premiere. I'm a Final Cut editor, have been for many years. I started on Premiere, but it's changed so much since then that I barely remember how to use half the tools. So this test was super useful for me and the results were impressive. Let's just dive right in. 
So interestingly enough, I think this is the first time that we've seen the memory make a difference in the Mac Minis, because the 8GB of RAM version only pulled in a score of 362 points, whereas 16GB of RAM on the next Mac Mini up from it gave us 529 points. Whether this is a rendering thing, or if it's just the fact that the GPU maybe had a chance to use more of the memory, I'm really not sure. It's an interesting result to say the least. However, when we move up to my gaming PC, the edge of having more memory seems to be kind of lost on Windows. I don't know if this is an optimization issue or what, but 48 gigabytes of RAM, more cores at a higher frequency, and a dedicated GPU only netted us 609 points, which is really not that much further ahead than the 529 on the Mac Mini with 16 gigs of RAM. But all of that pales in comparison to the Mac Studio, which cranked out 1,105. Let me say that again, 1,105 points on a box that sits silently on your desk, compared to a space heater cranking out 609 points. That's... That's wild. That right there, if you're an Adobe Premiere editor, the M1 Max is optimized. Go get it. Go use it. It is fantastic. That is really wild to see. So I feel like this might be an instance where Adobe is actually taking advantage of the media encoders built into the M1 Max. I'm not sure if that's for certain or not, but definitely seems that way considering how huge of a difference there is, even though on paper, I would feel like the gaming PC should be a touch more powerful, especially considering you have the NVENC encoder and you also have Intel's thing, uh, Quick Sync or whatever it was called on the Intel chips. I feel like those would have potentially evened the playing field, but maybe I was wrong. And now for the last test. This is one that might be a little more niche because I don't know as many people who use After Effects. Even I've kind of moved away from it after a few years, but I do use it once in a while. But this is the After Effects test. And this uses a lot of different things from 3D text moving around to motion blur, to 3D tracking of an environment. There's a lot of stuff that it throws at it. And well, let's just dive right in and see how each of the computers did. So like we've done in the previous two tests, we're gonna take a look at the Mac minis first. And this is again, another instance where the memory definitely seems to be making a difference, where we only get 498 points with eight gigabytes of RAM. We get 681 points with the 16 gigabyte Mac mini. It's kind of wild to see that that memory can make that much of a difference because really there's no other difference other than storage. Moving up again to the gaming PC, now we see a 687 point score. Less, not by much, but less than the Mac Mini. So even with the higher frequency cores, the 48 gigabytes of RAM and the dedicated graphics card, the gaming PC, admittedly by not much, still came in at a lower score than the M1 Mac Mini. And to put that in context, the M1 chip is the same one they're putting in an iPad. So either Apple's chips are no joke, or Adobe is just not optimizing as well as they could for PCs. And I'm gonna say it's probably a combination of the two, because I feel like Adobe's motto for making Windows programs is throw power at the problem and it'll sort itself out. That doesn't fly on a Mac. Anyway, enough comparing those two. Let's move on to the Mac Studio, which raked in 1,028 points far from anything else in the field. It's really impressive. I am genuinely surprised at how well this did. So aside from Blender, where I would assume the benefit that my gaming PC got was because of the faster video memory, the Mac Studio walked away from everything in every single one of these tests. And this is more real world than what I think a lot of other YouTubers are doing because this is using programs that people do use on a daily basis and throwing tasks at them that people would conceivably do. And it's genuinely impressive to see how this machine handles these tasks while being so quiet and so efficient and cool to the touch. Every single one of these tests, I was amazed these computers would maybe, at least on the Mac side, these computers would maybe crest 70 degrees on the M1s and on the Mac Studio with that beefy cooling system, it would barely crack like 68 degrees Celsius. It's crazy. Meanwhile, when I pulled up the temperature monitor on the PC, we were sitting at a hot 88 degrees, pretty warm. And when it threw it at the GPU, that was the coolest one, but even then it was still running at about 72 degrees Celsius. Either way, this is the most numbers oriented thing I've done. And hopefully you guys found something useful out of this. I really hope you did because overall, I don't wanna throw Geekbench scores at you because those are synthetic and just tells you, hey, if you throw Geekbench at your computer, it'll spit out this number. No, I wanted to actually give you something quantifiable, throwing tasks, 
that you might actually do at my own computers, basically beating the shit out of them for science and giving you something that will give you a solid idea of how these machines will perform on your day-to-day -day tasks. So if you're a photo editor, especially having an SD card up front, this thing is freaking perfect. If you're doing video editing, same thing. SD card up front, load the photos in, load the footage in, sorry, dump it all in, you're ready to roll. Fantastic tool for it. Even After Effects, barring some stuttering with the 3D tools and of course it being slower at raw 3D rendering with something like Blender, if you're all right with giving it a minute to render, it's completely capable. And with After Effects, I was actually kind of surprised. I haven't seen After Effects run this smooth in a long time. And of course, when it comes to Final Cut editors, you have all the advantage in the world when it comes to quick processing and turnaround times because Apple optimizes their software for their hardware. And as soon as the M1 Max chipset came out, we had a Final Cut update for it and it was game on. <laughs> at the end of the day, I really wanted to make something for you guys that would be genuinely beneficial. I didn't want to throw a number at you without context, which is why I spent so much time explaining what Puget Bench did and how I made my own personal test for Final Cut and what Blender did. I really hope that that made sense to you guys. I hope that this was helpful in some way. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure to leave a comment because I want to make more stuff like this that is down to earth, useful stuff. I didn't test audio stuff, so maybe I'll go throwing logic at this at some point. I want to see how logic does. I haven't really gotten a chance to use it yet, but let me know if you guys want to see that in the comments. And otherwise, I hope you guys have a fantastic day and I'll see you all in the next video. Make sure to be there and have a good one.